Hey, what is up guys? And welcome to the College Info Geek Podcast. The podcast where there's an iPad and a book on the table. Whoa. It's very unique. Whoa. No one else has that combination of things. Probably, maybe. Don't quote me on that. Uh, yeah. What's up, man? Oh, uh, no, 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 no. Yeah? Yeah, recording a podcast. Yeah. Know. I'm practicing <laughs> my voice sounds. Oh, okay. Is that, is that one ready. of those things that singers do before they yeah. actually perform? They just do one of those... Yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't need any do re mi's. I'm just like. Nah, nah, nah. That's probably more efficient than do re mi's. Yeah, because all those syllables are gonna wear out your vocal cords before you actually it's get so on hard. stage. It's so hard. You just need to mumble incoherently to warm up the vocal cords in the most natural, organic, and least stressful way possible. But yeah, and then you can get out on it's stage. It's GMO free. Yeah, GMO free vocal warm ups to win American Idol with. Yeah, is American Idol even still a thing? I don't know. That's a good question. I think it's like the voice now. I know everyone's kind of into the voice because they're nice. So maybe American Idol's kind of run its course. I don't know. Oh. In the comments below, tell us, is American Idol still going? And if it is, I'm <laughs> yeah. not I'm not gonna watch it. So I don't know why I'm curious about this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry to tell you, but this week we're not drinking tea. What's in there? What do you Mate. get? Latte which uh, according to you is one of those drinks that has become popular enough to have its own name and not to be mistakenly referred to as tea. Yeah. Unlike many other things. But it is also one of those things that you have to keep an eye on with the steeping. Though I did learn yesterday, um, mate is a lot more forgiving with over steeping than uh, tea is, especially like black tea. It's just, it's terrible if you oversteep it. But yeah, this stuff is not bad. But this is a mango blend that oh, okay. uh, we got at that tea shop that we went to. Cool. By the way, so last time we mentioned the whole idea of doing fake podcasts for outlining videos. Yeah. That was pretty useful. Yeah. That was yeah. reasonable. It's just, just like live brainstorming. You yeah. Know? It's just. We took a drive to the tea shop and just, just brainstormed uh, two different videos on the way. And now they're fully outlined. So I think that was a pretty successful experiment. And uh, if I could tell my 23-year-old self who was starting YouTube three years ago to do that, I would. But, and you can probably see this segue coming in right now. No, I can't. <laughs> we're not telling things to our 23-year-old selves today. Uh, today we're going to go over 10 things we would tell our 18-year-old selves. Oof. So that's like a lifetime ago. Yeah, it was... That's nine years. It was nine me. years ago for you, and it was... Like eight and a half. It was mostly you know. nine years ago for me, but my birthday is not for two weeks, so I can still say eight. Ha! Oh, wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're coming up on there. My birthday is in two weeks. You're yeah. almost dead. I... Wait, do you die at 27? You do. Are you dead? Yes. I've been talking to a zombie the whole time. Maybe that's why you're so, so chill. It's more nuanced You're just than like, that, my life but, isn't you know. ephemeral anymore. I'm just now a spirit. Yeah. Wandering the world wandering the wastes but yeah basically a lifetime ago you work awfully hard for a spirit people. that has absolutely no reason to be putting effort into things and and no time that is I, running out i have no reason not to be putting effort into things that's a good perspective yeah all right why not <laughs> you just flip a coin and you say i guess i'm working today <laughs> i guess i'm gonna work hard today well i'm gonna pour some of this mate and uh i think we should get into these lessons for our 18 year old selves you know lists like this or, or questions that are of a similar nature, such as, you know, what, what is something you would tell yourself five years ago when you were starting this? I always have trouble with them because of the whole butterfly effect thing. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm like well, if I told myself something smart and I, I went back in time and gave myself some advance warning about something, then maybe I wouldn't make some mistake that led to some really good thing. Yeah, well, um, let's just ignore those today, you know? Like, I'm happy with where I'm at. Yeah. You know, I don't. I don't want everybody around me to disappear. Um, yeah, I'm but. pretty happy as well. Well, there's this whole, there's actually a song by the Deer Hunter called The Right Wrong. And like the whole chorus is about, you know, if I could go back and, and restart and change the canon, like, would my life be different? And would I lose you? I forget what the, the line is. It's just like, would I lose all the meaning that makes misery worth it? Or something like that. Ooh, it's pretty edgy. I don't know. But it's probably a, meaningful it's pretty at the good. same time. Yeah. You know, the two are not mutually exclusive. But let's just pretend we're talking to like, there's a parallel universe and we're talking to our 18-year-old <laughs> selves over there and we're like, hey, you don't have to do what we did. We're already yeah. here. 
do something cool, see what happens. Yeah, it's a parallel universe where everyone is actually a bird, so yeah. there's no risk of bird you know, advice. disrupting the timeline because everyone over there was bird people anyway. Yeah, it's Earth so, 36. Yeah, all right, we're gonna tell you to do these things. Keep eating worms. We don't eat worms, but I do recommend that you continue to eat worms. They are very good for your particular physiology, uh, but do these, these 10 things. Now, to be serious, um, what really helped with this was getting myself in a frame of mind of communicating these lessons that would have been good for my 18 year old self to know to other people who may be of a similar age. Yeah. So it's, it's not like I would actually want to, if given the chance, go back in time and redo things with these lessons in mind. But I do think that people who, you know, aren't already 27 or whatever, they may want to know these things for the road ahead. Uh, and actually, you know what? I think we should have an 11th one, yeah. which is just stop being a dingus. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I don't know how actionable that one is. But I don't know. I would tell my 18-year-old self to just stop being a dingus. It's like that old saying, um, myself five years ago was a complete idiot, but if given the chance, I would love to stay this age forever. And, yeah, even and five years from now, now, you would say the same exact thing when you're 32. Man, I was an idiot when I was 27. What was I thinking? But I would love to say 32 forever. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm going to let you start out. All right. What do you got? All what right. kind of so words I'm of wisdom diving, you got? Diving right in here to 18-year-old me. We've got, uh, don't be so cynical, you know? Okay. This is, this is a tough one. You know, I, I went in deep. But instead of trying to get help and talking to someone... 18-year-old me let uh, depression cloud his worldview and became very bitter and judgmental. Mm. And, and basically the only path forward from there is humility, patience, and understanding because 18-year-old me is, me is better than no one, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Cynicism is really, really easy, but being sincere is really hard because you have to be upfront with yourself. You have to be honest with your feelings. Mm -hmm. You have to be honest with other people. Sincerity is really hard, and it's easy to just be like, oh, all of that's pointless. I'm not even going to try. It's like a really easy to see through mask. It's it's dumb. 18-year-old mm -hmm. me should stop that. Well, it kind of reminds me, and I, I do want to dig into this, like, to the degree that you're willing to go. Um, even with my close friends when I was younger, really in-depth, honest, and raw conversations didn't seem to happen very often. It seemed like... Our entire friend group was sort of predicated on sarcastic jokes and, you know, shared memes and things like that and, and quoting shows we liked or being not yeah. serious. And it was it was very rare when you'd have a real honest conversation where you'd reveal your vulnerabilities, reveal the things you're scared about, or actually state your beliefs with candor. And I always found it odd that the only person I was super honest with when I was 18 and younger was this person who really wasn't actually one of my good friends. He was just huh. a guy that we hung out with occasionally. And he was also one of those kids. And I, I think a lot of people go through this kind of a phase in life where they have a lot of insecurities. So when they're with certain people, they turn into bullies, not because they're actually sadistic people, but because those people just sort of amplify that insecurity and manifest it as wanting to put other people down or make fun of other people. Mm. Uh, so he was a guy who, because he was in the skater culture like me, ended up hanging out with people who were kind of bullies and would sort of bully me occasionally. But then on other days when he wasn't with those friends, we would end up hanging out and having a great time. And sometimes like having the most honest conversations that I have ever had as a teenager. And then with all my great friends, that never happened. Yeah. Which was really, really weird to me. Well, it doesn't help that in a group, it is much harder to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's And, like, true. you got to hang out one-on-one -on -one to really feel like, I can sort of gauge how this person's reacting to what I'm saying and stop before I go too far. But I can't be like, mm -hmm. how is, okay, they're creeped out, they're fine. Yep. They want to say something. It's You can't, like, get that deep into it because there are too many different people you're trying to not be, like weird to at the same mm -hmm. time because you want to be honest but you don't want to be so honest you're afraid of what might happen if you're honest right right so i mean to whatever degree you're comfortable talking about what was it that caused you to become so cynical when you were younger i'd i'd say that 
for the most part, when I was when I was younger, anytime between junior high and really actually even before that, I didn't have a lot of friends for a long okay. time. Didn't really leave the house. Um, was always lonely for a long time, not all the way through high school, but for yeah. a long time, just really lonely, both in the romantic sense and in the friendship sense. Mm-hmm. Just nothing. And you, know, you, had, you had friends though, didn't you? I didn't really have good friends until sophomore year of high school. Oh, okay. So this is earlier. Uh, and I had I had one good friend before that, but yeah. I didn't really hang out with a lot of people mm-hmm. before anything. The most I had was like online stuff. Okay. And that was pretty much it. Just just a lot of like loneliness and depression that made me into a bitter person who started to be really judgmental of the other people who are like, they're out having fun or doing something, but here's some way in which the way they're living is not as good or as pure as the ways I'm living. So obviously they're happy because they're stupid. And mm. like, so it's kind of like that whole idea where, oh, those people go out and party and they go to bars, so they're they're not yeah. as good as I oh, am. They're so shallow. Allow me to sit here and be intellectual and depressed. Yeah, got them. It's it's like that kind of a that kind of an attitude. Mm-hmm. B- but it's really just like it's so obvious that that's just a coping mechanism for saying why are they so happy and I'm not. Let me yeah. try to make it better by feeling better. Yeah, it's kind of like the bullying thing, but I never bullied anyone. You just kind of bullied yourself. Uh, yeah, other than myself. Like everything yeah. is always um, – any negative thing that I've ever done has always been aimed at me because I mm. can't stand the thought of being cruel to someone else. Yeah. Which has its benefits because I'm not cruel to other people. But it but it's meant like that a, I was really bitter inside yeah. back then. And it seems like a, a particularly difficult to deal with type of self-bullying because you're on one hand you're bullying yourself, but on the other hand you're telling yourself – I'm better than everyone else for these reasons, so I don't need to go seek help. It's like, yeah, it's I should like be saying, able to deal with this. Don't change, don't change. Yeah, because you're correct. You're just suffering for no reason. You mm-hmm. could change it and you could stop suffering, but don't because you're also correct, even though you're also not correct. And it's a really like a weird paralyzing position to be in. Yeah. So if you remember, uh, what were some of the first steps that took you from there to being able to ask for help and? Be well, open. I, I started uh, actually hanging out with people outside of my house. Mm-hmm. Something instant messenger just doesn't give. You know, there's a piece yeah. of it that it can't give because, you know, I was oh, back back in the day, AOL instant messenger and like stupid leet speak nonsense <laughs> and all this dumb internet stuff. But that was it. Yeah. And it doesn't give you the same level of friendship that just being no. around people can give you. So once I started actually leaving the house, doesn't really matter for what because the first several things I left for I never ended up close friends with a lot of them Mm. and I didn't necessarily fit in super well but I was still somewhere yeah and that was better so it's just gaining experience yeah and then eventually you ended up meeting the people that kind of clicked with you yeah and like it's you can't sit at home and say I'm not gonna hang out with anybody until I've found the perfect person to hang out with yeah that doesn't that's just like relationships you can't do that you have to get to know people You can't just sit here and wait for the perfect answer before moving. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Well, I think I should probably move on to mine, first one. Uh, So what I wrote down here is empathy, my dude. People don't always want solutions. This is something that has been uh, a hard-fought and hard-won lesson and one that I'm still not perfect at putting into practice. But when... I was a teenager. I grew up with a dad who basically had all the answers. Um, And I have since learned that he didn't have all the answers, but he certainly seemed to have all the answers. And he's just, he's a very logical, assertive kind of person. And I took a lot of that, probably genetically, but also because of the way I was raised. I was raised to be an assertive person who should have answers, who should be a leader, that kind of thing. And I think to a degree that is useful. But what I've learned, and I think a lot of guys in particular need to learn this lesson, when somebody is hurting, when they have a problem, when when their feelings are hurt, they don't necessarily want the solution to that problem right now. Uh, And and guys listening to this, this is something that you really need to learn about women in particular. Uh, But I think it's also something you should deal with or you should keep in mind when talking to your male friends. Um, When somebody is in pain, and something bad has just happened, whether it's their fault or not, 
right now they're not in a state of mind to go and solve it. Unless you have a particular type A robotic kind of brain like me, you have to give people a little bit of time to get over the emotions that come with something bad happening. So at first you wanna be empathetic and supportive and be like that shoulder to cry on or be the person who can commiserate, uh, be the person who can sort of be like, yeah, that is super dumb. Why would they say that? Or why would they do that to you? Or it totally wasn't your fault. And then later on, they're gonna want a solution. They're gonna to wanna to figure out how to fix the problem. And then you can be there to provide the solution. Maybe you had the solution all along and maybe your super logical brain was saying the whole time, we could solve this right now and move on and go do something fun and be done with this problem in five minutes. But that's not how most people operate. And you just kind of have to learn that. And I learned it the hard way. Um, my first serious girlfriend in high school broke up with me because I would constantly offer solutions to problems and I had no empathy. And I, I was blind to it. It's not like I was like, oh, empathy is stupid and I have no reason to use it. Let's just fix the problem. It was more like, I didn't even see that I was lacking in empathy. I didn't even see the option of being the shoulder to cry on. The only potential you know, thing that I should do when a problem came up was to fix it. And that is still my default state of mind. So for me, empathy is work. And maybe this is not a good thing to reveal about myself, I'm not sure, but, oh, it, no. but it is, and I should be honest. Um, empathy is work for me, not because I don't care about people. And I do think like I, I don't think I'm a, like to the degree of like a sociopath who can't feel empathy. I can. It's just that my mind tends to prioritize fixing the problem over being empathetic. And I have to work to be like, no, wait, the problem can be solved a little bit later. Let's tackle the more immediate problem, which is that the person is in pain and they need emotional support. Yeah. And like a lot of the problem there is that you can't rationalize emotion away. If I come to any sort of conclusion or feeling through something that wasn't rational, mm -hmm. you can't you can't just say, well, yeah, but how about this? And then suddenly the tears stop and, and the, the madness is gone because also it's, it's like our brain wants to have exaggerated emotions. So when you're in those periods of like yeah. sadness or anger, like you want to let it out. You can't just say, okay, we're done. We're going to hold it in. We're done. This is healthy. Exactly. Yeah. Be rational. Mm, you can't do it. It's bad. And I think if you're a person like this, like me, the next time you find yourself in a situation where you're hurting, you're going to naturally come up with a solution. But I think it would do you well to take a moment to just sit down and analyze the emotions you're feeling. Because I guarantee, even if you're the kind of person who gets over these emotions quicker than normal, you're going to feel, like you said, that tendency to sort of amplify the bad emotions because you kind of want to like lash out a little bit or you kind of just want to like let them out. So I, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I said something really stupid to Anna and I felt really bad about it. And I sat back and analyzed my emotions because I knew like there was, there was no real fix other than eventually having a talk about it, saying I was sorry and moving on. And in the meantime, I just had to like get through the crappy emotional place I had put myself in. And I remember feeling like, I just kind of like want to run away and like change my name and go to a different country and just never yeah. talk to anybody again. And I knew that was completely irrational. And 10 minutes later, I didn't feel that way at all. But in the moment, it's just like, yeah, for some reason, even though this is completely illogical and irrational, I do want to just abandon my entire life and start over again. It is the only thing I want, <laughs> uh, which is completely ridiculous. So if I, as the rational, you know, semi-robotic type of person that I am can feel something like that, then other people can too. Yeah. And to be a good friend or a good partner, you need to support that and provide basically that shoulder to cry on first before you help them fix the problem. Wait until they're in the emotional state to want to rebuild before trying to force them to rebuild. Yeah. All right. What's your second one? Okay. Number two. This, this is an easy one. Pay attention to posture because <laughs> I didn't grow up with all this technology. You know, I remember not <laughs> having internet and smartphones not being real. Yep. Yeah. I remember so getting my first it's Windows really hard 95. to predict back then. And and still, there are people right now who, are, who were more familiar with all this at a younger age than I was who still aren't doing this because society hasn't really reacted that quickly to the fact that our posture with computers, laptops, and phones, constant use, we're not 
really adapted well to it. We've been doing nothing but like ruining our necks and and like I see it everywhere I go. Yep. Society wasn't ready for this. We have not yet no. reckoned like with with what this is doing to us. So we need to take care of ourselves before technology makes our later years incredibly uncomfortable because back pain is not something that's supposed to define your 20s. Yeah. It's, well, it shouldn't define you know, anything. Well, hopefully, hopefully ever, but your 20s is very early. And I think that this overuse, because now like 90% of what I have to do mm-hmm. takes place on this technology. And a lot of jobs are moving that way. Yeah. We're on phones and computers all the time and laptops, especially that it's just not ergonomic. Isn't that crazy? Like, like all of society just changed. We've built lives for ourselves where you have to look at a video display all the time. Well, you don't have to, but like you can easily yeah. make a job where that is what you do. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of jobs have gone that way where you're spending so much time on this thing that we don't really know how it's hurting us all the way yet physically. Yeah. And that is just it's going to be very unfortunate when an entire generation feels it at the same time. And now I have a list I could probably list quite a few friends who have complained about RSI like repetitive strain injuries and stuff with their nerves or something with their neck like it's just yep. it's starting to happen and everybody's going to feel it at the same time and they're well, just, I've had I've had RSI ruined. in my hand um at 19 and that was from typing and people listening to this can't see but it was from typing with my wrists firmly planted on the desk ooh that's a bad my, position my hands bent up PS, so you really want to piano either yeah don't play a piano like that either you really want to train yourself to kind of have your hands hovering over the keyboard at a sort of like a parallel um, angle to the table. And then you're just, you know, it's a little bit more effort because you can't lazily just slam your arms down on the table and use that for support. But in the long run, it's better. Yeah. And then I have dealt with on and off back pain for probably a couple of years now. Um, and it goes away when I exercise regularly, lifting weights, doing yoga, stretching, getting outside, making sure my hip flexors are, you know, nice and flexible. And it comes back when I go into those manic periods of sitting in an office chair for 10 or 12 hours a day yeah. for days on end. And, you know, it's really weird. Like, it's so weird that human beings have such problems prioritizing their health. Like, we prioritize money. We prioritize follower counts on social media. We prioritize, like, resumes. But we don't prioritize the chronic pain. And I don't, I don't get it. Um, yeah. And the slight tangent, but this is the second chapter of Jordan Peterson's book where his, like the whole question is what, you know, we have a dog that gets medication from the vet. We always give it the medication on time. What, why don't we do that to ourselves? And um, this is where the book kind of started falling apart for me because he uses like the whole story of Adam and Eve to try to like make this argument that the reason we don't take care of ourselves is that we have internal self-loathing and the fact that we're self-conscious and, and creatively able to harm people, we're, we're just secretly disgusted at our, our own natures and our vulnerability as you know life forms that will eventually die, which I think is a load of hawkwash. I think yeah. it's, I think the reason we don't take care of ourselves is there's that constant battle between short-term gratification and long-term needs and goals. And when you're taking care of a puppy or a child, you can't feel their short-term wants. Yeah. They have no sway over you other than them telling you what they want. You can't feel it. So you know, okay, this long-term thing is more important than the short-term thing. I'm going to give the dog the medicine. But with yourself, it's difficult because you're like, I kind of just want to lay on this couch and watch more Zoids. I don't want to go take my medicine. or I don't want to go walk a mile to rehabilitate this knee injury. It's going to hurt. Yeah. So I actually may put that book down, to be honest, because I thought that second <laughs> chapter was a little bit ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's kind of crazy, right? We don't well, take care of ourselves. Well, health is like the most important thing you have. So yeah. if you don't have your health, I, I had to quit my hobbies and quit my job after two years of being unable to like barely, I could barely move my hands from yeah. my injury. If you lose your health, you will lose money. You will not be able to take care of the people or animals or anything that you love. Mm-hmm. So you can't even say that you fully prioritize like uh, a relationship or a child or something above your health. Because if you let yourself get so unhealthy that you can't take care of them or you die early, you have now like prioritizing other people you care about means prioritizing your health. Your health because you have to be there. Yeah, nothing is going to fix health when health is the root of your everything 
Yeah. So prioritize that. Um, before I move on, can you give our listeners maybe some practical tips on how to make sure their posture is taken care of? Okay. Um, obviously use your phone less, but when you need to use it, I now feel more comfortable lifting it more up to eye level because the neck is an, is a large area of the problem because your head is Mm -hmm. heavy. And when you have it straight, it's balanced on your spine, your back, all of your muscles are holding it up. But when you push it over your neck is now like pick up a dumbbell, hold it straight and then hold it out in front of you and see which one feels heavier. Yeah. It's definitely the second one. And you're doing that to your neck. So you want your neck to be straight and your shoulders aligned with your ears, basically. And laptops are not good for you because you have to look down at them. So if you can mm. hook them up to a screen or something, or at least as much as you can, have a computer set up where the monitor lines up, like the top of the monitor is at your eye level okay, or something. The, the more you can keep your neck up, the better. And something that's helped me a lot when I, when I feel bad is I find that... Ironically, um, either, one, going outside is pretty obvious. So if I go outside and I walk, even going to the store and like pushing a cart around, I walk and stand in a better posture than I sit. Yeah. And Absolutely. if I want to have better posture at home and I find that my muscles have weakened, I have a chair set up with like this uh, lumbar support thing so that I'll sit up straight. And then I just say, I'm going to play video games for an hour because as long as I'm sitting in this chair correctly, I am forcing myself to do nothing but sit in a good posture and give my neck a break Mm. for an hour. Okay. It's ironic that video games could help, but anything that would keep me in that posture without messing it up is a good break. Yeah. Okay. Um, To offer some of my own, regardless of how much studying you have to do, take a break at least every hour get up and go walk around and do something. I actually have a pair of dumbbells that I bought in a pull-up bar for my door so I can get up from editing or whatever I'm doing, go do some pull-ups, do some curls and some shoulder presses and some lat raises, just something that's not locking my arms into typing position for hours on end. And then what I have found is that getting on a schedule of exercise, and it could be anything, but I find that lifting is a great complement to whatever else you're doing is very helpful to uh, not only preventing chronic injury from manifesting itself, but also healing it. Um, And this is something that I think, I didn't put on this list, but the whole idea that like bed rest and just rest in general is going to heal an injury is very antiquated. And doctors and scientists are learning that uh, rehabilitation usually comes through. It's, It's a combination of rest and also using whatever it is that is injured in a healthy way. Yeah. So, you know, not doing the chronic thing, but using, you know, say I have an arm injury, you would need to use it. Otherwise it's never going to heal again. In fact, uh, the book, the power of habit talks about how people who have uh, knee replacement surgeries, there is a pretty low full rehabilitation rate because it's very painful to walk on that knee, but you have to do it. Otherwise it will never fully heal. The body has no reason to do it. Short-term right? desires versus your long-term outcome. I don't want yeah. to hurt right now, but I also want to walk in 10 years. Exactly. No pain, no gain. Um, so what specifically helps me is going to the gym, working on core strength, which supports the back. Um, I don't do targeted back exercises like lower extensions or hyper extensions. I used to do those, but I've been told by uh, the guys at Starting Strength that's actually not a good thing to be doing. Basically, they were just like, when in nature do when in nature did human beings bend over and then constantly target that lower back muscle over and over and over again? I'm like, that kind of makes sense. That that's a pretty Mating fragile dance. muscle to be. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just do you know back squats um, and then work on core with like captain's chair stuff like that, uh, and then yoga, which helps a lot. But yeah, take care of yourself. Don't allow a chronic injury to creep into your life if you can help it. Yeah. All right, number two for me, uh, you don't need to pad your resume. Work on stuff that's cool and go hard on it. So this is something that I definitely would have told my 18-year-old self because I came into college believing I needed to fill out my resume as thoroughly as possible. So I joined stuff that I really had no interest in. I joined the computer advisory committee where I would meet with faculty to decide on 
budget distributions for IT purchases. Uh, I joined the academic standards community as one of their student representatives, and we would read the letters that students who had been kicked out or who were on academic probation had written to, you know, beseech the committee to let them back into the college after failing once or twice. And I had to help decide, should we let this person back into the college? I always said yes. <laughs> I wasn't going to read that, that letter and be like, nah. Yeah. <laughs> they could just go work at McDonald's for the rest I of their life. I just want a taste of power. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I did those things just so they'd be on my resume, just so I would have a well-fleshed out, you know, activities and leadership section. Now, this isn't to say that you should do absolutely nothing to get leadership experience or that you should, you know, not try new things because you think you have to stick to everything. Like we talked about in the essentialism episode, the true essentialist is actually more of an explorer than the average person because they want to find the thing that truly does resonate with them. But doing things just for the credential is not useful. Yeah. Going to college just for the credential, not useful because what is that credential going to get you? A job that you're not fulfilled by. What good is that? Yeah. You know, unless you have a very good reason that you need to make a lot of money, like, I don't know, some evil villain is holding your family ransom for a million dollars and they're giving you like 14 years to pay it off or something. I don't know. I, I doubt that most people have that situation. You know, explore, find the things that are interesting to you and then go hard on them. And yeah. don't worry if your resume isn't 14 pages long because you may have one line in the resume that's more impressive than... Johnny Goody Two Shoes over here that has 14 clubs on his resume. You know, maybe some old stodgy consulting firm is going to love that kind of a resume, but somebody doing something truly interesting is going to look at your resume, see passion just oozing out of it, and hire you. Yeah. All right. Number three for you, my dude. Okay. <sighs> Got to go deep again. Okay. <laughs> here I go, thinking too hard about hard lessons. This one's a hard pill to swallow, but it's very important. Learn how to swallow pills. Oh, is I, that hate, a good lesson? I hate swallowing pills. That's I will no. It's pretty awful actually. I won't learn that lesson. <laughs> Dear eighteen year old self, forget how to swallow pills. No, I, I broke a big one in half once and it got stuck in my throat for Ooh. a few seconds and I was like, I'm done with pills for life. Go away. Yeah, they're pretty bad. Anyway, that's number that's not number three. Number three, eighteen year old Martin is not nearly the nice guy he thinks he is. Really? Okay. This is this is one of those tough lessons, you mm -hmm. know. But uh he needs to realize relationships don't define you or your worth, and the universe does not owe you one. Mm. And that being friends... You mean romantic relationships? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and being friends with a girl you like means nothing if the whole time you're just waiting for them to come around and be like, oh, I wanted you the whole time. If you just, oh, yeah. If that friendship is just you hoping to be rewarded for it, it's not a friendship. It is mm. nothing. And you're just as disrespectful and manipulative as all those, like jock or player stereotypes that you hate you're just less honest with yourself about it <laughs> and that's it's yeah. that's incredibly harmful so if somebody's already rejected you and you don't if friendship isn't enough you need to just just go just move on yeah. stop pretending because movies have done this like you keep on trying you stick to your guns quitters never win you just stick around and someday they'll realize that who they loved was their best friend the whole time. Like, they make it into this huge romantic ideal. It's but basically it, making girls out to be a video game. Yeah, it's dumb. In real life, that is not romantic. That is yeah. creepy. You need to calm down. Uh, you don't earn a relationship. A lot of things in life are based on luck. Sorry, bro. Yep. If if you failed the luck test, there you, you got to try somewhere else. There's nothing you can do. And Sometimes the mean jock is actually a nice guy and yeah she yeah, actually just, does like him just, sorry <laughs> yeah it's just it's just dishonest to assume that sitting around waiting to be some knight in shining armor is anything that happens in real life that yeah. is nothing because the way movies make that out they're disrespecting the decisions and freedom of the girl or whoever involved that you happen to be obsessing over for no reason right and Respecting their autonomy is important. And actually, I r came across this quote really recently that Terry Crews said on The Daily Show mm -hmm. within the last week, and I thought it was really good. And it was, it is impossible to love someone and control them at the same time. Mm. So you need to let go. Stop trying to, like, think, oh, their decisions are stupid. Soon they'll realize I was the right decision. You're, tr you're like... 
judging other people's lives a little too much. Yeah. And that makes you not the right answer. Mm. And I think that while I figured that out pretty quickly within the next, you know, five years, I didn't have to wait till now. I didn't just figure it out yesterday. Yeah. But that would have been a good lesson for 18-year-old Martin and really anyone, as clearly society has a terrible problem with this, yep. especially lately. It's not great, and it's just it's not romantic to keep trying. It's, it's dumb. Yeah. You need to stop. You know what? I didn't write this down on my list, but I think it needs to be said. Um, and I, I think my 18-year-old self knew this. I think my parents taught me this lesson quite well but it's a lesson that a lot of people need to, to learn. You got to learn how to lose. Yeah. You know? And I honestly think that a lot of the problems our country is having right now um, stems from the fact that we talked about this, the expectations and having them violated is like the worst thing. This is why slave uprisings happened when freedoms were taken away rather than just from people who were always downtrodden. A lot of people that are growing up today don't know how to lose. And they grow up with this expectation that the world owes them something, you know, or they grow up living a life where everything is given to them and then eventually they lose and they don't know how to deal with it. And it could be a girl rejecting them or it could be the fact that they don't have friends or they could be, you know, not getting into a school you apply for or not getting a job that you want or not getting a scholarship. Regardless of what it is, you have to learn how to lose gracefully. This is why I absolutely hate it when I hear about little leagues and, you know, kids sports organizations giving out consolation prizes or having no winners and losers. You know, everyone wins because they participated. I think that's more harmful than, than good to do that because you're teaching kids at a young age. Just because you participated means you won. And then they grow up and they're unable to deal with the event where, you know, life smacks them in the face. They can't take it. Yeah, well, you and sometimes like the they snap. Sometimes they snap. Wrong deal. Absolutely. But it didn't. You know, That's, it's just chance. Stuff happens. And and for the people who want to get political in the comments, obviously this is not the only issue. It, it it combines with other issues we have. But I think that this is the root. We have so many people who don't know how to lose. Their expectations are shattered, and they cannot cope with it. So this is why I say expose yourself to difficult things. Uh, at, at the lowest level, play video games on hard mode. Yeah. Let yourself lose because the people who are successful in life are the ones who lose, get up, and then they try again and eventually win. There's not a single successful person in the world who got there because they always won every single time. Nobody's Ozymandias. Everyone yeah. loses. And the successful ones are the people who can cope with it. Yeah. I think it's really important to not confuse losing with being a victim. Yeah. You, sure, you can be both, but they're not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Losing at something honestly that you tried and failed at is you're not being victimized by anything. Yeah, that's losing just, just means you tried. That's, that's a good just thing. how it works. You know, you're not the victim, you're the protagonist. You've just been set back a little bit. Uh, all right, so my next lesson here. Uh, stop kidding yourself. Your acne problem is a result of your diet. Oh, no. <laughs> you're going to have to eat new food. And I want to do a video about this at some point. When I was 18 years old... Um, what, whatever you may think about my physical attractiveness now, it was not so good at 18 years old because my face looked like the dark side of the moon. Uh, and so did my back and so did my chest. I had a horrible acne problem. A lot of teens have it. Uh, mine was worse than, than usual. And I tried everything that the commercials and the websites and blogs tell you to do. The proactive regimen. I did everything short of Accutane because I think Accutane had been like outlawed or something by the time <laughs> I was 18, or I'd heard that it could mess with your vision or something, and I was not willing to mess with my vision. I like my vision. Good it's good. Call. Um, but I tried, you know, the proactive regimen. I tried swabbing my face with tea tree oil and witch hazel every single night. I put like this crappy, crusty thing all over my face that became like a face mask every night and went to bed, and it would get all over my pillowcase. And then I tried changing my pillowcase every night and showering five, five times a day and drinking like six gallons of water, and not six gallons of water, but like actually two gallons of water a day. Wow. That's not an exaggeration. That's a lot. I tried literally everything. And while I was doing this, I went through final year of high school and freshman year of college, depressed and very, uh, with a very dismal look upon my personal, ex 
appearance and also my self-worth. Uh, I literally believed that I was not worthy of any girl out there because I was too ugly. Uh, now, obviously, this is a bad mental state to be in. And hopefully anybody dealing with a physical problem like that can find some way to look at themselves in a more positive light, regardless of whether they are able to deal with that or not. But it was my diet. You know, all this time I'm doing all these regimens, like 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes at night, swabbing this stinging crap all over my face. I'm going to lunch and I'm eating ice cream and I'm eating like burgers with the white buns and everything and just loading up on simple carbs and sugar. And I, I kid myself because I would eat salad bars. So I'm like, no, I eat tons of vegetables and I eat tons of fruits and tons of protein. Yeah, but you also still eat a bunch of yeah. simple carbohydrates and a bunch of sugar. And that is what's causing your acne problem. And to this day, when I eat a lot of sugar, I will get acne on my face. Not as bad, because I've aged out of like that really horrible period, but I'll get it. I think I've got one right somewhere. I'm, I don't know, I woke up with it. And uh, I ate chocolate the other day. <laughs> Uh, and it happens to my mom. My mom is like 53 years old now and she will still get the odd pimple when she has too much sugar. So uh, there, there's a growing body of scientific evidence about this, though the link is not definitive at this point, but I am convinced that the reason people deal with as bad of acne problems as they do is because of the diet we eat. And I do not think that it is just a you know, a question of adding more vegetables and, and good, you know, fish and stuff like that into your diet. Do that for other reasons. You got to cut out the crap. Uh, it's funny how, like, resistant we are to changing food. Yep. Out of out of every single habit we might have, mm -hmm. when it comes to something that's like, hey, that's unhealthy. You probably shouldn't eat that. Really at all, but at least not yeah. very often. Well... Do you have any pills or surgery <laughs> or complicated regimens of other things? Or maybe could I just avoid it and not realize that I have cancer for a while? Because then it'd be pretty fun for a few. Like, yeah. food is like the last thing anyone wants to fix. They know it's wrong. We mm -hmm. know it's wrong. I know what I eat is wrong. I and I and I'm like, I uh, it's it's just one. No, it's not. It's yep. not one. It's like 15. You just forgot what you ate yesterday <laughs> because you're dumb. Stop it. Yep. We know the answer. We just refuse to do it because we're so comforted yep. by food. Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't confuse me all that much because at the end of the day, it's chemicals in our brain that are driving us to want certain things. Yeah, well, we're and literally those addicted. chemicals are produced by the food and the fuel that we put into our bodies. So, of course, we are going to want, you know, the greasy, salty, sugary things that spike that dopamine loop and everything. Well, they were formulated to be like basically addictive and, uh, yeah. and also coffee by itself not bad but our relationship with it terrible because we use it for energy that we would have had if we were eating a better diet and sleeping enough and yep. taking care of ourselves but we're like how about i don't sleep i overwork i eat garbage i don't drink water but i'll just you know you can't you don't want to see me before i've had my coffee in the morning yeah <laughs> exactly it's because we're just we're trying to stick a Band-Aid solution always. Mm -hmm. Don't come to our food. We don't want to deal with it. <laughs> Anything else with my food. Yeah. So uh, whoever out there is dealing with complexion problems, acne, anything with the skin, you know, go see your derm. That's fine. But also take 30 days, cut all the simple carbohydrates, all the bread, all the wheat, all that kind of stuff cut as much sugar out of your diet as you can, eat vegetables, and I don't know about fruits. My gut feeling says fruits are kind of an exception, or at least not nearly as bad, but you cut the fruits if you want, but really just cut like the cake and the cookies and the soda and all the, the crap that you know is bad for you. Cut that, um, you know, eat more fish or eat, you know, tofu or whatever it is that's, that's healthy if you're vegetarian or vegan. Um, make sure you're hydrated. And additionally, wash your face a couple of times a day and change your pillowcase, maybe every couple of days and see what happens after one or two months. Yeah. I guarantee you things are going to start clearing up. It may not be the silver bullet, but it's going to help. Yeah. Just and I, improve the fuel that goes into your body and you're going to improve the body that that fuel is going into. Yeah. I do think fruit is an exception also because of the, it's not an exception if you ate a bunch, 
But yeah. there was this documentary where uh, this teacher guy put it really well, and it was like, when you go to eat an orange, how many oranges do you eat? Yeah, you eat one orange. One. <laughs> but when you drink a glass of orange juice, how many oranges did you just eat? Like, <laughs> yeah. 23? Yep. Like, that's... We don't. We get full when you eat the fiber and when you eat a fruit. We don't... Yeah. Where they, they load way more sugar into something else than before you get full. That is kind of true. You ever juiced an orange? It's like you a get like, quarter you cup get like of liquid. Nothing. So you drink yeah. a whole glass, and I just ate like half a tree. Yep. And that's why I had too much sugar. It's because I would never have eaten that much. Yeah. So there you go. Eat your fruit, and and don't buy canned fruit. Prepare it yourself. Yeah. I guarantee you're not going to eat a ton because you're going to spend all this time cutting or peeling or or dicing or whatever it is. You know, you're just going to take so much time up. Yeah. In fact, uh, there's there's this documentary called Cooked which is based on a Michael Pollan book of the same name. And there's, I, I can't remember who the guy they were interviewing was. It was in the second episode, I believe, um, where he says, all right, here's a great diet plan for you. You can eat all the cake, all the cookies, all the baked goods, all the ice cream you want. I only have one rule for you. You got to make it all from scratch. Yeah, completely scratch. Completely like, from scratch. Like you didn't buy chocolate chips from the store. Nope, you <laughs> made your own chocolate. Yeah. Uh, and here's what you're going to do. You're going to do what everyone else does. You're going to start buying simple ingredients that you can make into healthy meals relatively quickly because it is so much easier to dice up an onion, to dice up a carrot, to dice up some celery and make some mirepoix and throw some meat in there than it is to bake bread. Yeah. So much easier. And it's better for you. You know, doesn't mean you have to cook, cut out every single thing, but that would be a pretty good diet plan. Yeah. All right, number four for uh, you. My number for four, you. don't over-systemize your life. Okay. So basically, over the next n- nine years, Martin is going to lose the curiosity and simple pleasure of free time because yep. all of these productivity systems, they're a response to an anxiety, a mm-hmm. fear that I'm not going to accomplish enough. And because I'm afraid that I won't accomplish enough or I won't be worth enough, because of that, yeah, I try to force my life into this po- this box where I've forced future Martin to succeed. Like, ha, look at all these rules I set. Now you have no choice but to succeed. Yeah. You're going to. But you can't just trade joy for success like that because the best work, the best inspiration that I get, and I think that really anyone's going to get, comes from joy, even from pain, but not mm. from a forced and robotic life. Yeah. So, so like, yeah, I good. love my morning routine. But I've minimized pro- like uh, productivity sets and specific rules and specific you can do this then as long as you've done this mathematical equation three times to make sure you've done it enough. Yeah. And it's, it's too much. We're not robots. And you can't f- force like your best work. Yeah. yeah that's, that's good. We should revisit that point in next week's episode about building habits because I do want to talk about tools like yeah. Abitica. And, you know, I think we should... And they have a place. Yeah. We should talk about this balance between systems and regimentation in your life and also freedom. And there's that whole pendulum concept, right? You're always sort of like either going to one side or the other of perfect balance. It's like that whole concept of the uh, yin and yang. You know, you're walking the line between order and chaos and you're never quite perfectly balanced yeah you know balance itself is just the act of falling in many different directions and changing the direction in which you're falling so that you don't fall but you're never truly just standing there you know you can't be like those people who stack rocks in the river the human body will always fall to one side or the other yeah so it's just a it's just a a matter of correcting those falls before they become uncorrectable all right uh let's see here so (laughs) <laughs> this is actually sort of the opposite to yours, Uh oh. which is, you know, it's actually kind of nice that we use the pendulum metaphor. Uh, more free time does not equal more productivity. Oh, that is. Yeah, that's good because that's also true. Yep. So the context of this, and this is actually something that I would tell my 21, no, 20 year old self. Uh, freshman, sophomore and first semester of junior year in college, I was very regimented. I had all these clubs, all these jobs. And my junior year, the first semester, I actually had two jobs. I was an RA, and then I also worked at the Business Career Services Center at the front desk, as well as having clubs I was a part of. 
and running College Info Geek, and of course, doing classes. So I got a little tired about, of doing all of it, and I wanted to go harder on College Info Geek. So after that first semester ended, I quit both of those jobs, and I moved to the on-campus apartments near where you guys lived, and I told myself, all right, I'm just gonna do classes and College Info Geek. I'm gonna give myself all those hours of the day I was spending on those jobs, and I'm gonna use it to build this into a business. Uh, and you know what I did for that semester. I came over to your guys' apartment and played Marvel vs. Capcom every single night. Well, you had plenty of more time to work. <laughs> you had so much more time. Why yeah. do it now? So much more time. And if you go back into the archives and look at how many posts were published on the site during those months, it's like two or three a month versus, you know, sometimes seven or eight per month when I was super busy. Yeah. Uh, as it turns out, when you cre when you create unstructured free time for yourself – you aren't necessarily going to be productive with it. Uh, so what I learned is you can give yourself that free time, but you need to put yourself on a publishing schedule and treat yourself like a professional. So I had another situation where I had graduated. I had all this time, College Info Geek was a self-sustaining business, but instead of just doing whatever I wanted to and writing an article whenever I felt like it, I said, you're gonna put out a podcast and a, an article once a week. So now I had a schedule. And now I knew there was a deadline and then I started becoming more productive. And then I added the videos into that. And you can look at both the analytics and the income of the business and the size of the team over time. That was the point at which the stagnant line of progress or lack of progress turned into that trend line of upward progress. It was because I put myself on a schedule. Yeah. So don't quit your job or quit school or whatever it is thinking, I'm just gonna give myself all this time to you know, learn how to code or learn how to build video games or write my novel because you won't do it. You got to have some sort of time pressure to do your art. Even if you think you're super passionate about it, you won't do it. Well, if you're You'll not get mired to do in perfectionism. It now, yeah. If you can't give it an hour right now, then why would you give it eight hours then? Yeah, you're not going to do it. And you and I have had friends who've been like, you know what? I've got like, I've got a few months of living expenses. Maybe I'll quit my job and I'll just spend eight hours a day learning how to build video games or learning how to, you know, or writing this novel idea I have. And that same person is not spending their after work hours, even a half an hour of it, learning to code. Well, I think you write like a habit of doing your project. You, yeah. you get it, you get used to working on it so that throughout the day, you're still thinking about it. And you're like, what am I going to do next? And if you mm -hmm. haven't built that habit, you come across all this free time, you're just going to be lost. Like, I actually don't know the next step at all. I haven't even yeah. mildly thought about how to make this a realistic goal. Yep. Uh, I'll figure it out tomorrow. <laughs> and then tomorrow becomes the next day. And yeah. You never get it done. So, yeah. Uh, what's your last one? Mambo number five is uh, try more things. And I know everybody says that, so I'm going to go one step further. Especially try things you do not even think you'll like or that you're afraid hmm. of. Okay. Because if if I spend my whole life desperately trying to avoid a bad experience, I'm going to miss out on a hell of a lot of good experiences because I couldn't have possibly predicted them. Yeah. And also because you can't have a 100% positive life. Sometimes you need to be you need to be able to take a loss and be like, I went to this thing, it sucked. <laughs> uh, whoa, that was an experience. Yep. I have essentially lost that time, but I've gained the knowledge that I'm willing to try things, even if they don't necessarily have to pay off. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good attitude to have. And there's a quote that I recently read. I'm reading the second girl who circumnavigated Fairyland. I think it's uh, the girl who fell beneath Fairyland and led the rebels there, but it's really long. Mm -hmm. So if I'm wrong, whatever. <laughs> and the quote is, I shall not be afraid of anything I haven't even seen yet. Mm. That's good. And I, and I really like that because, like, if if you haven't tried it, you know nothing about yeah. it. You don't know if you're going to like it. You might have a really good idea. But especially uh, when I was in college, especially back in, you know, the formative years where you're more or less trying to find your identity, trying things I didn't even like would have at least made me more accepting of other people for liking those things. I would have been like, I see what you like about that now. Mm -hmm. But I realize that I personally can't. And yeah. that's okay. It, it would have been better. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Uh, all right. I think we're going longer than we initially planned, so I'm oh, going I to... Oh, I knew this one was going to take a bit. Yep. Steamroll on to my last one. Uh, all right, so my last one here is don't ask for help 
right away. Use the 15 minute rule, which we've talked about many times, but I do want to tell a story from my 17th year of life. Actually, this was before I was 18. So I would need to go back one year prior and tell my 17 year old version of myself. Um, when I was 17 years old, I was looking for a job, you know, something after school. And I intended to walk into this local pizza place to, uh, become a pizza delivery guy or something like that. But before I did, as I was walking down the street, there was an insurance place right next to the pizza place. And I saw in the window help wanted. And I thought, you know what, as a high schooler, why would an insurance place ever hire me? Cause I still have this belief that high schoolers can only flip burgers and deliver pizzas and bag groceries. Uh, but I went in anyway and I said, Hey, I saw the thing in the window. You know, I'd like to apply. So I did, I interviewed pretty well. I got the job and I worked there for about four months, I think. And I was basically just like your typical office dude who filed things. And, um, I did bookkeeping, I reconciled QuickBooks and went through the credit card statements and all that kind of stuff. And at the end of four months, um, the reason I left that job is because they fired me. So they fired me for two reasons. And this is like one of the, the big shames of my teenage years. One of the reasons, and this should be another lesson, was that I didn't really respect the culture and the company and my place in the company. Like I would kind of just like do things my own way, even if they didn't like it. And that was just like, I should have been more respectful. Uh, but the other reason they fired me was it was a small business. It was, you know, a husband and a wife owner, and then maybe three other people. So she was there like two desks over from me. It's not like this big company. And you know, if I would get stuck and I'd be like, oh, I don't know how to process this credit card transaction. I don't know what category it goes in. I would immediately go ask her for help because I was super afraid of screwing up her books. But usually when she would show me what to do, it would be something that had I sat there and thought about it for maybe like 30 more seconds, I could have figured it out. So I was allowing my fear of messing something up to paralyze me and not only impede my own progress, but waste the time of the person who had hired me and who was currently spending her money to take all that stuff off of her plate in the first place. Yeah. So not only was I making her do the work that she was doing before she hired me, I was also wasting her time because now she's doing it slower because she had to explain to me how to do it <laughs> over and over again. And I remember her telling me like, Thomas, a lot of these things you could figure out if you just sat there and thought about it for maybe 10 minutes. I can't have my concentration broken. I'm doing my own work over here. So stop calling me over. Uh, so this is the thing, the 15 minute rule. When you get stuck on a problem, try to work on it for 15 more minutes. And while you're working on it for those 15 minutes, document the problem from the perspective of somebody else who's gonna help you. So write down what you tried that didn't work. Write down exactly where you're stuck. Then go get help if you can't solve it after 15 more minutes because you know you don't wanna be wasting your entire day stuck on something. Yeah, It's a balance again. But when you do this, number one, you are getting past that initial paralysis, that initial fear of screwing something up and you may solve the problem. And you're also looking at it from a different perspective, which will also potentially help you solve the problem. And you won't waste the time and incur the wrath of the employer who will eventually fire you and make you feel like your life is over. Yeah. Um, yeah, footnote, my life was not over. I actually ended up not dying that day, but it was pretty awful getting fired. Well, now that I know that there's <laughs> that that black mark on your resume, I'm gonna have to let you go from the College Info Geek podcast. Dang it. Yeah. What are you gonna do? Actually, because that happened, every video I've ever made, every podcast I've ever been a part of, it's all actually wrong. Yeah, so this is a coup. <laughs> this is mine now. <laughs> Done. I wonder I wonder how you would do on your own. I wonder how I would do a temp <laughs> how would I wonder how the public would respond to a literal coup of, of like like everybody would know. It would be, kinda, be it would be really funny. Like would actually. they just be like, This is just as good, or would they be like, But we know what you did? Like, <laughs> it doesn't really matter if I it's think good. I would be more emotionally distraught if they just were totally fine with it and they yeah, were like, I, This I, is better. I feel like it's you <laughs> you should be at least a little invested in that the people that you look up to don't be usurped. You should you know? <laughs> you gotta have that loyalty. Nope, off with his head. I always thought the CIG <laughs> podcast would be much better if it was just Martin <laughs> monologuing to a camera. Yeah. Uh, and now it's finally happened. Yes. <laughs> uh, 
All right. Uh, so unless you have any secret hiding additional lessons, uh, I think those are our 10 lessons. 18-year-old uh, Martin, cut your hair, you hippie. Yeah. There it Stop is. Stop being a dingus, 18-year-old Tom, and eat better food. All right. Uh, well, hopefully you guys found this episode helpful. Um, actually, you know, a- anybody who's not 18, like anyone that's older than that, I would like to know what your lessons to your 18-year-old self would be if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook and you have access to the comments section. Otherwise, uh, show notes for this episode, if there are any show notes. Maybe we mentioned a couple of books or something. I don't know. Um, there's probably stuff. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I don't know. There's probably something. Yeah. Whatever Whatever we did mention, uh, you can find it at cigpodcast.com slash 213, or you can click the link to the show notes in the description, either on Facebook, Watch, or YouTube, if you are watching us do this podcast right now. Uh, beyond that, if you have questions, you can always tweet me or tweet Martin. I'm at Tom Frankly. You're at Yo Martholomew or comment on the podcasts or send smoke signals, whatever it is. Uh, We want your questions so we can develop them into new podcast episodes or at least five questions episodes. And uh, last but not least, you can find all of our favorite apps and tools and books and uh, things you should bring to college and all sorts of other cool stuff for students at collegeinfogeek.com slash resources. So thank you so much for hanging out with us and we will see you in next week's episode. Stick you.